Good afternoon, good afternoon everybody and welcome to the sweltering northeastern corner of South Africa where we are sitting in the Greater Kruger National Park, 2.2 million hectares of wonderful South Africa that extends into another one and a half million hectares of Mozambique to the east and Zimbabwe to the north. We are on the western fringes of the Kruger National Park here in a little game reserve called Juma. And to the west of us, Arethusa, we also traverse. You are on a live sunset, well, not yet, afternoon, we'll call it at the moment, sweltering afternoon sunset drive. And it is live, as I say. My name is James Hendry. I will be presenting today. Behind us, making his debut solo on camera, is David Eastbaugh, correct? Eastall. Eastall. East Sorry, it's a very strange surname. I've never heard it before in my life. On the other vehicle, heading off towards the east, not the east store, is Brent Leo Smith, and he is being filmed relatively ably by Andrew Joseph, a.k.a. Anant Francis. And in the final control, we have got Nicola Austin on the vocals and Leanne making her debut on the keys. So it's good having them with us, and it's better even having you with us. Please talk to us, hashtag Safari Live. If you're on Twitter, questions at wildearth.tv if you happen to be on the email. It is, like I say, a hot day, 37 degrees centigrade, 97 degrees Fahrenheit. So not a cool, coolsome day. And we are in the midst, in case you're a new viewer, of a fairly severe drought. It is February and the landscape should not look anything like it does in a year of average rainfall. Some buffalo bulls in front of us there, and they, I don't know if you've noticed, or have been sort of infiltrated by a hippopotamus bull who is living in this very soupy water here, a water combined with a lot of buffalo dung, some algae, some hippo dung, possibly some urine of about four or five different species, and no doubt the detritus of the terrapins, whose heads you can see bobbing up and down all over the water there. They're a little bit difficult to see. You might be able to catch one or two terrapin heads, and those terrapins have been climbing up onto the back of the hippopotamus, alternately summing, sunning themselves and then nipping back down into the water to eat an invertebrate or two, or perhaps even some algae. I'm not sure. I don't think they eat algae, but I've seen their mouths moving very excitedly in amongst the swathes of algae. So that's what's going on here. And then we started the show, of course, with that little herd of elephants, a beautiful herd of four elephants, one we know very well from the chopped off trunk that she has and her three cohorts, one of which, or at least two of which are her offspring, one of which is my, maybe a sibling or a very, uh, or perhaps one of her offspring from an, I've nearly said earlier marriage, that's why I became tongue-tied, which is totally ridiculous, but maybe her earliest youngster. I think she's only about 25 years old, so it's unlikely that she's had three calves by this stage, but it is possible, of course. And thank you all very kindly for your welcomes to David. It is uh, lovely to have him with us. We'll see how he does. Feel free to ask questions about him. I shall put those through, and uh, should he feel the need to answer them, he will. Otherwise, he'll probably just do this, which means that he doesn't wish to answer that sort of a question. Beautiful. Um, <laughs> some beautiful ox peckers there, and I've heard, I hear from Michelle that it is National Hippo Day. I'm not sure in which nation it's Hippo Day. I don't know that South Africa has a Hippo Day, but perhaps it does. So, well, happy Hippo Day, Peter. There is, of course, another hippopotamus in Gallagher Pan. We'll call him George of Gallagher, and this chap can be Peter of the Pan. And uh, they are experiencing their national day. How wonderful for them. Now, this morning, Scott and I were out. We were following cat tracks all over the place. The one road that we didn't go, uh, it happened to contain the Unkahuma pride on a freshly killed buffalo. Unfortunately, we missed all of that. But out and about this afternoon, Brent Leo Smith, together with Andrew Joseph, a.k.a. Anand Francis, and they are with the Lions. Take a look at them now. 
Welcome to this evening's Sunset Safari, and we are sitting next to the Inkahuma Pride, all five members present and accounted for, doing what lions do best with a full belly, and that's snooze in the shade. With the occasional rolling over, there's still quite a lot left of their kill, which is a, looks like a sub-adult buffalo. And isn't that great? It means they should be around here for a day or two. And we might be in luck that the Birmingham boys might come join them. My name is Brent Deo Smith. I have Andrew Francis on camera. And this is the Inkahuma Pride of Lions. Now, they are the lions we see the most. Uh, we didn't see them for a while, but really great to have them back. Everything sort of settled down after the ousting of the Matimba males and the Birmingham Coalition taking their place as the rulers of the northern Sabi Sands. So I'm not sure exactly when this happened, but probably early hours of this morning uh, or late last night, but they haven't fed too much on the carcass. It was actually behind us. I will try to show it to you a bit later. Andrew might be able to just give you a glimpse of where it is. They've tucked it into a bit of shade, but as the day has progressed, the sun is beating down in that area, and they all got full bellies, and there's no big males to contend with, so they're not forcing themselves to eat too quickly. Yes, you look very hot and bothered, madam. Now, this is the little sub-adult who's not so little anymore, is she? Um, Reclosing on two and a half or three years old now. And soon to be of mating age. And I think her spot in the sun is safe now from the Birmingham's. She's sort of old enough now that, that she's a potential breeding partner and they're probably not going to kill her. So you can see lots of deep panting as they try to expel some of the heat caused by digestion. It's also an extremely hot day out here in the Lofalt. And these lions will be chuffed. And they've got meat and they don't have to move too much. We're going to spend some time here. Hopefully they do start feeding, but I can't see that happening in the next five minutes. But while we sit with these sleeping lions, I've got a nice little African folklore about lions for everyone. It's a, how a lion got its roar. It's a Batoka story. Oh, there we go. Nice yawn. And as with most African folklore when anything mischievous is done, is done by the scrub hair. Oh, bless you. Look at that belly. You can see it flowing. So, it said, after creation, all animals only used to eat trees and plants, including lions, and only after man, who was the last animal created, did the other animals start feeding on meat. And the other animals copied man and emulated them. And the lion became the most successful of these meat eaters. And at that time, they had a very quiet voice. They would only whisper to each other. So it made it really easy for them to catch all the different prey species around. So Hare and the other animals got together. And Hare put forward the proposal. We need to give, I think the, the exact words, lion, a voice like the summer thunderstorms, so we can hear when they're coming and we can avoid them. And all the other animals thought this was a splendid idea, but they weren't quite sure how Hare was going to pull this off. And Hare, being the mischievous creature that it is, gave him a wink, a twinkle of his nose, and said, leave it to me. And he scuttled off and he stopped nearby. The king of the beasts, big male lion, said, oh, mighty one, oh, mighty one, your brother is desperately ill and he sent me to fetch you. Now, Lion, being a family man, was quite worried about his brother, so followed Hare off, and Hare took him on a wild goose race through the bush for kilometers and kilometers till the lion was too tired to even move, and he just slumped in, a, under, in the shade of a tree and went to sleep. The Hare went to his co-conspirator, the honey guide, and the honey guide took him to a nest of bees, a big beehive, and he raided the hive. And he, of course, gave the little bit, the bonus to the honey guide for helping him. He then took the comb and the honey and dribbled it all around and all over Lion's face and paws, and then went off and hid behind a bush. 
and it said when the bees returned home from foraging and found their, their, raid, their nest raided, they were really, really upset, and right near the hive was this lion covered in honey. So the whole hive began to sting, sting, and sting the lion, till eventually he cried out in such great pain that his quiet voice became a monstrous roar. And that is a Batoka story, so actually from uh, the Zambezi Valley. Uh, so a little interesting little African folklore. Because at the moment, the lions are not very active. So while we stand by, hopefully these lions are going to move their way to the carcass or hopefully even pull their carcass into the shade where they are now. But until they do that, let's jump on board with James, who's got another member of the Big Five. So the same elephant herd, everyone, has just come along into the fringes of this very shallow depression or donga or drainage line or stream. I never know what to call it because it's called so many thousands of different things around the world. Basically dry stream. So there is a little bit of water down below the surface here, which makes the vegetation on the fringes that much greener. And this little herd is moving along through here. We can't really get much better, a much better view than this, I'm afraid. So I don't think we'll be here for long. I'm just going to roll slowly back and see if we can't get a slightly better view. Right, I don't think we'll be able to. The little one is suckling in there. We might just be able to see that. Through the back end there, we'll zoom in. Just behind that last bit of bush. Anyway, and apparently the youngster in front of us has a little bit of a runny tummy. Shame. There's the little one, enjoying the shade provided by its mother. And, of course, the green vegetation of this drainage line. So for those of you who are perhaps new viewers, while we're watching this elephant selectively choosing the bits and pieces of the tree that he wants to eat, a drainage line is another word for a dry stream. So if were there to be a flood, water might sort of drain from the area through the stream into larger rivers. So that's what I mean when I say drainage line. And that elephant, although it looks like it's sort of trying to just eat anything, it's actually being very selective, even to the point of rejecting some of the shoots on the tree and only taking others. And I think that's because they have very sensitive ability to tell how much tannin and other chemicals which might be used as defenses by the plants are actually in the leaves that he wants to eat. It's very clever. Lovely flapping ears there. And this is an important thing that elephants do in heat like this. They flap their ears, the blood gets pumped. All of the blood in the body will go through their ears in 20 minutes. And what that flapping does is cool it and straight from those big veins that you can see in the back of the ears, so that blood goes to the brain. And of course, if you can keep your brain cool, you can survive hot temperatures. If your brain starts to boil well, then eventually everything, all of your systems are going to shut down. And that's why most animals will concentrate on keeping their brains cool. Now, Peter NG on Twitter, you want to know how many different species of animal there are in this reserve. Peter NG, that's not an easy one to answer, believe it or not. And how do we keep track? Well, good question. Peter, um, why are we talking about that? Remember, an animal is anything that belongs to the animal kingdom. So it might be an insect, it might be an arachnid, it might be a mollusk or a millipede or a centipede. It could be a mammal. It could be an amphibian, a reptile, a bird or even a fish. Anyway, I think what you probably mean is mammal, I'm going to guess. We know that there are probably about 300 or so bird species that could possibly be seen here. Mammals, I've actually never counted them, and I'll tell you why. It's because, I mean, we've got nine antelope species, we've probably got four cat species, two dog species, uh, five mongoose species, 
Mm, two vivid species. Um, I hope you're counting, Peter. It's very important that you count all of these now. Uh, so two vivid species, one mustelid, which is the honey badger. And then, of course, we've got things like bats. I have no idea how many bat species we get here. I don't think anyone knows how many bat species we get here. Some of the bats are so difficult to tell apart, you can only tell them apart by opening their mouths and counting the ridges on the underside of their palates. I personally don't wish to get that close to a bat, but you do get odd people, and normally who sort of smell slightly odd, who come about the place with their slightly dirty clothes and dirty fingernails, and they will come and count bats and check out what they look like. Anyway, those sorts of people are very important, but they haven't been through here now. So it's difficult to say exactly how many mammals we have here. Um, one elephant, of course, we've also got buffalo. So, Peter, I hope you've counted all those. I'm going to try and do it in my head as we drive along, and I'll give you a relatively accurate -ish count of the number of mammals that we get here. Thank you for your question. Please keep talking to us. I cannot sit at that angle anymore because we are parked on a very steep slope. Hold on, David. Samantha Jane, you are both, well, one of you is concerned and one of you is encouraging. Uh, Steph, you're concerned that I'm going to feed something to David and make him eat something from the bush here. And Samantha Jane, you think that would be a very good idea. Uh, I am definitely going to find something for him to eat. Remember, I don't, I'm not going to find anything unpleasant for him to eat, but I will certainly give him some of the finer parts of bush cuisine that we have out here. I'm not particularly good at eating uh, animals out here. For example, you can eat a polyrhynchus ant, which tastes like a lemon drop, or you can have some termites, which taste like peanut butter. We can also do some more vegetarian stuff, and I think we'll begin with the vegetarian stuff before we move on to the more, um, well, let's say squeamish versions of what we have to eat out here. I'm going to check the Gallego pan, then I'm going to Sydney's dam, and while I'm doing that, let's go back and see how those lions are faring with Brent Leo Smith. So, we can still see the lions haven't moved much. There's been a bit of rolling over, but it is fantastic that they're here. I'm as pleased as punch to be able to spend the afternoon with these lions. And amazing. Sorry, guys, I'm just having a bit of a problem with my radio. There we go. And the amazing thing is that we often watch all the documentaries on TV, and it's always high-paced, high action. But this is what lions do for about 20 hours of the day. John on email is wondering why their mouths are open like that. Is it helping them cool or faster? It is, uh, John. So uh, lions aren't able to sweat, so they have quite a big problem with getting rid of heat. And uh, they've got lots of blood vessels in, in their mouth and in their tongue particularly. And being able to draw air over that cools the blood and helps them to cool down. And particularly now that they've got very full bellies, they have even more trouble dispelling heat because uh, digestion, the pro digestive process actually causes heat. So when they've got full bellies, they are less active than normal. But we have, oh, there we go. Is she going to roll over again? And when we popped up, when we arrived here, the sun was a little bit higher up and we parked in here and we were started off in the in the sun here, but as it's cooled down, the lions have actually moved closer to us and they're coming creeping into our shade. And it wasn't shade when we arrived. And they're able to digest meat at an incredible speed. And we 
Inkuma. You can see one of the older Inkuma lionesses. She's got a broken right canine there. And that's not uncommon in, in cats, and big cats in particular, to have broken teeth, even from quite a young age. And this little girl, I think she's got all her teeth still. And that lovely light just filtering through the trees onto the side of her face. Here it's took the lioness who's furthest away. See if we can see if she's got any broken teeth. Her mouth's open. Oh, she is behind a bush for you. Oh, dear. Uh, well, we'll have a look a little bit later when she gets closer. So, a lot of you, I know a lot of you, your favourite lioness is the amber-eyed lioness, and that's the lioness lying there on the left. Can't really see those beautiful eyes of her just yet. And she is snoozing. She seems to have both her bottom canines. And she's in magnificent shape at the moment. So, Debbie in North Carolina. Oh, look at that back feet of that lioness there. You see those perfectly formed pads with the three lobes. Debbie, I'll be back to you in a second. So, Debbie in North Carolina is wondering about the pregnancy of these lions, and is it too soon to know whether they are pregnant yet? I would say it is. I would say they're more than likely not. Um, as I said, we're probably only going to get cubs from the next set of matings. What month are we in now? February. I probably end of June at the earliest. July, more than likely, even possibly closer to the end of the year. Uh, it's not... As, as lines go, they're not 100% certain that the Birminghams are going to stay. So they're often pretty long and have false estruses when they mate uh, to make sure that the new coalition of males are permanently in the area and they're not going to move off uh, or be threatened by another coalition. It's unlikely because there are five of them and there's a very strong coalition. And I think for now, I think the lionesses will just be biding their time before they actually get impregnated. And that is an evolutionary adaptation uh, to make sure the lionesses don't put a lot of energy uh, in birthing and trying to rear cubs when there is a possibility they will get killed. While we stay with the lions, let's go have a look at what James has got. Well, those kitties are not going everywhere, anywhere, everyone, and I know that they are a major source of fascination for many people, but they're not going anywhere, so let's just keep an eye out for other interesting things like this. We had came across this female who was calling. She was going, bleh, 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 bleh. And then we heard, meow, 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 from the other side. In fact, there's lots of calling going on in this little herd, and you can see that the little youngster is still trying to suckle. Now, not far away from weaning, I wouldn't imagine. Remember, they are now mm, just over two months old. By three months, they'll be fully weaned, and you can see the little horn starting to come up on that little male. And so I'm very sure, yes, as Nikki just said, it looks painful. It does, quite apart from the fact that her nipples look like they're going to be tugged clean off the, her belly. That little... Ram has got little horns now, and that cannot be comfortable, having them spiking into the underside of your belly. So that little youngster will be almost completely weaned by this stage, but I suspect they will try and suckle longer, these youngsters, because, of course, the vegetation is that much more sparse, and so possibly not particularly delicious when compared with mother's milk. Now, just before we drive on, I'm going to ask David to pan, pan, sorry, tilt, David, up towards the sky, which is being covered slowly by a very large gray cloud. Now, of course, as I've described to you before, the clouds here are very like South African politicians. They uh, promise a great deal and deliver almost nothing. And this one, I think, is going to be no different, but for to say that the pressure today has been dropping very quickly. So there's been a steady pre bu pressure build up until today, and now suddenly it's starting to come down again. And so there is some weather coming in. 
what that means. It probably just means a lot of clouds going to swirl about, probably one or two spits or two, and then we'll get the ramp up again of the pressure and its concomitant ramp up of heat. Saturday predicted 41 degrees Celsius. Whew, that is very hot indeed. Let us move along. I'm going to stop here and let's just have a look at this Impala U. It's a beautiful colour coming through this little woodland here. And why are we doing that? Alison, you're 11 years old and you live in North Carolina. I'd love to know which part of North Carolina you live in because I have been to North Carolina. There are two places there. And you want to know if the drought is going to affect the elephants. Definitely. I've just been past another elephant. Alison, that looks, is looking very thin indeed, and I think it's absolutely going to affect the elephants. It's going to affect all the animals except the predators to start with, and then if it gets bad enough, it will begin to affect the predators as well. Just look at this. This is interesting. You see those two impala of different sizes. The one on the left is smaller than the other two. There, those two are pretty much the same size, and that other one was noticeably smaller than these two. And I think that's because it was born not in November, but for the second breeding season, probably in the last few weeks. The little known second breeding season of the Impala. And greeting each other. Now, Heidi, you're also in North Carolina. I'm being inundated with from North Carolina this afternoon. You want to know if the drought benefits any species. Well, yes, it does. It benefits the predators for now because the antelope and their prey species, the herbivores, become weaker, so it becomes easier for them to be caught. Also, the vegetation becomes sparser, so it becomes like a winter landscape, which is favored by the predators because it's easier for them to see what they're going to catch, especially coursing predators like um, wild dogs or cheetah. They love it when it's a bit clearer and they really enjoy the winter time. That said, past a certain tipping point, when animals start to die, then it's going to become more and more difficult for the predators because they too will then struggle to find sufficient meat to eat, which is going to be a problem. We're a long way from that point yet, but a hot day like today with a hot wind blowing out of the north is really going to dry things out. And you can see the little ones there just picking off the last pieces of the Zizifus tree, the buffalo thorn, and that is, of course, going to be David's first bush meal, but not that particular tree. I'll find him a slightly greener example. See, he's picking off the last of the leaves there. That's actually beautiful. And this tree, of course, was pushed over by elephants. And while we consider that tremendously destructive, look at how the elephants are feeding those impala. There you can see an entire network of branches lying on the ground of this Zizifus tree that's been pushed over by the elephants. Right, on that note, let's head across to Brent Leo Smith, see what's happening with his lions. I suspect quite strongly would put money on it that they are lying about doing nothing. Uh, James is spot on, and the lines have not moved an inch since we were last here. Yeah? Okay, we give them another 20 minutes or so before we move on, see what else we can find. We'll always come back once it's a bit cooler, and hopefully they might start feeding. Now, this is the Inkahuma pride. And in Kahuma is the Shangan name for brown, a brown ivory tree. And the first time they were ever seen was in the shade of a brown ivory tree. They're not in the shade of a brown ivory tree today, but in the shade of a bush willow and a weeping wattle. You can 
See, even with the mouth closed, how quickly her throat is moving, you quite often find that all of a sudden the mouth will open when she gets a bit hot. There is a nice breeze coming in from the north that will keep them a little bit cooler. And they've got fat little belly. And you can see there those massive four paws designed for tripping or gripping onto potential prey species. who's 11 years old and in North Carolina. Uh, Alison would like to know how long do lions live in the wild? Well, Alison, uh, in the wild, in, this, in an area like this where there's a lot of other predators and there's lots of other lions, uh, a lioness generally won't live much beyond sort of 14, 15. Occasionally they can live older, but that's a good average age, sort of 12 to, to 15. Males, 12 is about as old as they get in the wild. In captivity, they can live up to 25 years, but the competition for space and breeding with lions is very, very intense. Uh, this area has got one of the highest lion densities in Africa. From here through to the Eastern Kruger National Park, uh, we get really big prides and lots of lions. So there's a lot of movement. So there's often coalitions of males that have now left the natal pride. And we saw that with the Matimbas. I think the Matimbas are 12 now. Andrew, do you know how old the Matimbas are? 12. Yeah. So 12 years old, they've managed to cut themselves a little niche down in the south. But uh, if there are any young males moving in, the Matimbas will be in just as much trouble as they were with the Birminghams coming through. So male lions, 12 is a good age for a male lion. He's had a good long life. In a lot of places, they don't even normally get to that age, just depending on the competition with other males and, and what's happening with the lion dynamics in the area. Yeah, watching Andrew intently, not really, sleeping more intently. There we go. The fifth lioness lying up a little bit further away from the others. So these lions have successfully caught a cape buffalo. And Peter's wondering, is it mostly true that lions hunt at night? Yes, it is, Peter. Um, they hunt when it's cool, and obviously in the dark, they've got a better chance. Their camouflage works better. The diurnal animals' eyesight at night is not as good as during the day. But they mostly hunt during the dark. And But one must remember that they are complete opportunists. So if something happened to wander into them right now, they would definitely go for it, even though they've got the majority of a buffalo left and full bellies. I will not never say no to an easy meal. And those paws again. Our front paws on a lion are much bigger than the back paws, and they're holding a lot bigger muscles, and they're also holding the neck and the head. So you'll notice with a lot of the cats, and the big cats, their front paws are much bigger than their back paws. And we look carefully, you'll see the flies on her. Those are really irritating. And those are mostly stable flies. Uh, they look very similar to a house fly, but they pack quite a nasty little bite. And they are vampire-like flies, and they're busy feeding off the blood. And you often find them congregating around a lion's ears, uh, tail, even their face. So, Jean in North Carolina is wondering, are there only four Inkahumas left? Jean, there are five. We've got four in a pile right next to us. There's three, uh, there's four, and there's a fifth one that Andrew will show you in a second. 
lying up behind uh, the others. There we go. You can just see that. The paw resting on a little round leaf teak. A gene, all five in Kahumas, present and accounted for. Now, what happens when we sit in quiet sightings like this, especially because of the drought, sometimes we are also feasted upon by the stable flies, but more irritating than the stable flies, and more irritating than the fact that they are here is that my cameraman squashed one. Now, I'm going to wait for one, and it should land on my arm in a second, or on my face at the moment. It's a tiny little stingless bee, called sometimes called a mapani bee. I'm just going to wait so we can get one that we can show you. Oh. And you can see the flies there getting a little bit irritating. And Andrew and I are literally being engulfed at the moment by tiny little stingless bees. And it's all Andrew's fault. Because Andrew squashed one. And this particular little stingless bee releases a pheromone to tell everyone else that there's sweat to drink. So because Andrew is squashed, we are now completely engulfed in little stingless mapani bees. A very warm and hot, actually, welcome to Marlo Hardy, um, who is wondering, when lions give birth, do they have a den? Do the rest of the pride stay close by to help defend the cubs? They don't, so they do have a den, but the rest of the pride don't stay close by. What will happen is a female will sequester herself off, away from the rest of the pride, and she will have a den in a very similar area to where leopards like to den, a little cave, a rocky outcrop, thickets in a river Rhine area and she will give birth to the cubs in there and she will not take them to the, the rest of the pride for sometimes after a month, even two months sometimes. So what happens is the others might just they'll be a little bit rough when they play with it and in certain circumstances if they're very young the other lions might eat them. So they will keep them away from the rest of the pride until they're old enough to be able to deal with sort of some of the rough and tumble that happens within a pride. sit here I said for a little bit longer and see if they move if nothing we're gonna go see what else we can find and come back later in the meantime James has got a feathered creature to show you I come to you now everybody with the knowledge that I'm actually not sure what I'm looking at to be honest it looks to me like a Pratt in coal which shouldn't really be found here. And Scott and I saw them, of course, a little while back. In fact, they, uh, this, that's why it's confusing. The one on the right is a juvenile. The one on the left is an adult. The now on the right is an adult. So that one moving is the juvenile. That one on the right is an adult. And they are called red-winged pratincoles. Red-winged pratincoles. I don't know why they're called red-winged Pratt and Coles, given that they don't seem to have red wings. Oh, they've got red on the underside. Now, what is interesting about these birds is that they are very uncommon in this area. I've been in this area for 10 years now, or more than, and the first time I saw them was with Scott the other day. We were on Biffle's Hook at one of the big dams there, and we both saw these things flying about, and we thought, well, what on earth are those? And that's what we came to, red-winged Pratt and Coles, and now they're knocking about here in the clearings. Yes, now that, that one there, of course, is, is coursing after something. And Pratt and Coles, as far as I understand it, I thought they caught things. Yeah, they feed mostly in the air in flocks, but they can obviously run along the ground. Hmm. They're related to the courses, you see. Yes, and sorry, as Scott is, Scott is sitting in the final control, correcting my ecology here. They're no longer called red-winged Pratt and Coles. 
Thank you, Scott. I'm not pouring you a drink tonight. They're now called collared Pratt and Coles. Anyway, they're related to the courses, and what they're doing now is actually behaving exactly like courses. Now, to course, of course, is just like a cheetah. There's one right in front of us, David, if that's easier. I don't know, but otherwise stay with the one you're on. They, to course after something means to run after it on the ground and catch it on the ground like a greyhound, basically. And they are, these practicals are renowned for catching things in the air, but clearly they are related to the courses. Bronze winged is the course that we get here and they're very adept at running along the ground. And what helps them to do that, of course, is that they lack a hind toe. So they've only got the three toes in front, and they've just got a sort of vestigial spike out the back. And that's very effective if you want to be running along the ground. The beak is not open because it's smiling, of course. The beak is open because it is sweating, panting. This is a fantastic, fantastic sighting. I've never had them flying, sitting this close. I've never had them on the ground. Last time I saw them, they were just flying around at 100 miles an hour. This is fantastic. Yeah, and we're watching, as Nikki says, we're watching a live kill here. You know, coursing after things, catching them, devouring them, panting away, wagging their tails in joy. And I'm sure they're picking up termites. I'm pretty sure that's what they're going for. Isn't that wonderful? So doing precisely what the book says they doesn't they don't do. That's wonderful English. What the book says they doesn't do, they is doing it. They is running along the ground. Coursing. Coursing like greyhounds. Coursing after a whole lot of insects that they're on. Well, there we go, we're just gonna pick up another one. Unbelievable. Huge wings for flying. But he's running. <laughs> and Charlie on Twitter, I do apologize. You say that my North Carolina accent leaves something to be desired. I'm sorry about that. It's been a while since I saw my friends from North Carolina. I have a sort of... Um, I have a sort of amalgamated blanket, very bad southern accent that I use for everything in the south. So um, from Texas to South Carolina, North Carolina, um, Georgia. Sorry about that. I apologize profusely. Right, so that is the collared Pratt and Cole. And the collared Pratt and Cole is not alone here on the uh, clearing. There are some warthogs just over there. I'm just going to try and find my radio and turn it down. Look at that. Now, we've seen these warties here just about every day over the last little while. We come past here. Sydney's dam is not too far from here. And the warties are making good use of the last of the vegetation on this clearing. Now, this clearing has got... Is, the soil is white in colour mainly because it is quite sodic. Now, what that means is that there's quite a lot of sodium in the soil, quite a lot of salt. That, in turn, makes the grasses a lot more nutritious, which, in turn, attracts things that likes to eat nutritious grasses. I've just done it again. And really, I'm speaking like I'm from the East End this afternoon, which, of course, is attracting things that likes to eat it. Sorry about that. I will attempt to better my language as the afternoon goes on. I think it's the heat. My brain is probably boiling. Oh, apparently we're going to head back to the lions because there's high action there. Some of them are relieving themselves. So, what happens when you eat buffalo very fast is it comes out of you quite quickly. And Andrew is making funny faces because we are downwind at the moment. And a predator, a predator scat is possibly some of the smelliest stuff you'll ever encounter in your life. And there we go. There's the other one who's gone to death catch. She's moving in to come join the rest of the girls. And the pride is looking particularly well at the moment. All of them in really good health. And the predators are the animals that benefit most 
during a time of drought, lions in particular. Here comes Amber Eyes. Hello. A little bit of greeting. Well, Mr. Tuvok is wondering why Amber Eyes has got Amber Eyes. Well, oh, Amber Eyes has put her head flat down. Uh, it's the same as uh, with people. Why do I have green eyes and other people have blue eyes? It's a, it's a, it'll be a genetic thing, and uh, the eyes work the same. She's just got slightly different coloration in her eyes. Uh, it's not unusual, uh, but it isn't that common. As you can see, we've got all the other lionesses have those beautiful golden eyes, and old Amber's got a slight red reddish tinge to hers. <laughs> that is, it's almost begging to be licked. Please lick me. watching in Holland uh, would like to know if a lioness lives to about 14 how many litters of cubs can she have in her lifetime well it's a it's a it's a different that's a difficult one because you must remember there's very high mortality rate uh, with uh, lions and they lose a lot of those cubs but theoretically if she mates for the first time normally probably at the earliest let's go on the earliest is about three so, and then she'll probably only then have another set of cubs uh, when those cubs have got to about two, so five, and then, oh no, no, so five, so one set. Maths is not my strong point. Something happening. Oh, looks like she might go to the carcass, so let Andrew film her while I do maths in my head, which is a dangerous thing, me doing maths in my head or anywhere. She's literally just passed underneath Andrew. He had to keep dead still while she was that close to him. There we go. You can see the buffalo carcass there. So I would guess they can, at the most, probably have six maybe seven litters in their lifetime uh, out of those that probably are successful reach ad adulthood and you probably say only one or two litters out of out of that six or seven will, where all will be successfully raised uh, lion litters can vary from one to four but normally it's two or three cubs i think the record which is in, in captivity so it's a very different thing it's a huge amount of cubs i can't remember exactly offhand but maybe someone out there i know oh there we go she's looks like she's about to try move the carcass there we go. trying to pull it through the the gap i don't know if we should tell her it's probably easier from the other side <laughs> Quite often, when one starts feeding it, can spark the other to come join. And all the girls on the other side, their heads are up. So, hello to Kiki, who's nine years old and lives in Ohio. Kiki would like to know how much bigger are the male lions. Uh, a lioness 
like this probably weighs, weighs between 110 and 120 kilograms. Uh, let me try to work that out into pounds for you, Kiki. And a big male can weigh up to about 230 in this area. I think the Birmingham's are around 200 to 10, so probably 100 kilograms more than the females. 100 kilograms is just over 200 pounds. No, more than that. Yeah, 240. Yeah, 240, 240 pounds. So a lioness is probably about just under 300 pounds, and a male lion's probably around 500 pounds, so quite a bit bigger. Oh, it seems like time to give up. That was too much effort to move that carcass. But Darlene in New Hampshire is wondering, apart from protection, what does a male lion have to do with the cubs? Does he show them any affection? Does he teach them how to hunt? I thought Andrew saw somebody moving behind me. Um, well, Darlene, they do actually sometimes show great affection with the cubs and will play with them. And also on a carcass where they keep the lionesses away, they will often let the cubs feed with them. So they do show affection towards the cubs. As when it comes to teaching uh, how to hunt, they don't. And I've spent a lot of time with lions over the years, and I don't think you need to teach any lion how to hunt. Uh, as long as the lion gets hungry enough, instincts take over. So I don't think the lionesses play a major role in teaching uh, the others how to hunt. Maybe with specific species, sometimes like elephants, I know that that's a bit of a different thing, but normally I don't think any of the lions need to be taught how to hunt. You take a captive bred lion from a zoo and you put it somewhere where there's impala, eventually it'll get hungry enough and it will catch one. Instinct does, in instincts just take over. A nice hot welcome to Peter NG. Uh, welcome to Safari Live, Peter. And Peter's wondering, how far do lions travel? Normally, normally they'll do five or six kilometers in, in a night if they are on the move. They can do, males in particular, can do up to 20, 25 kilometers in a night, but that's unusual. Normally, five kilometers is about what they'll cover. leave these lines for a little bit oh what's she up to looks like well we're just gonna hang on for a second looks like she's gonna come pull the carcass from the other side there we go that's much better took you a while madam and you can see the raw power as she's going to pull it away hopefully <laughs> the next little while we're just gonna hang around with her she does look like she wants to move it into a position where she's gonna be able to feed She's decided. I think they've somehow managed to really get that carcass caught in amongst those sticks there. Uh, she might just feed while sitting right there. I'm going to move forward a little bit. It looks like one of the other lionesses might come join as well. serious about eating she's still got a full belly and now that the sun has gone behind that large cloud blanket it's a bit cooler oh no she's i thought she might be coming down to join the other but i think she's going off for her bathroom break so James has got one of the cutest little creatures to show you. We're going to stay with these lines a bit longer now. 
uh, to see what happens here. Just as you've come back to us, these beastly little piggies have gone behind that log, and I'm not sure that I can get into a better position. Anyway, I just thought I'd quickly show them to you. There are five youngsters, as far as I can tell, from two sounders. There are two sows and five little piglets. And the interesting thing that I wanted to share with you was that many of you will know that they do kneel to feed. That's actually the wrist joint, of course, that they are sort of kneeling on and crawling along on. And yes, a few days ago, I was asked, do they have calluses on those knees? And I've just found out that the calluses, they do have calluses, but those calluses actually form on that wrist joint while they're still fetuses. So they're born with the ability to kneel down like that on the wrist joint and be very comfortable as they move along trying to eat whatever they can find left around here. And normally this will be subsurface rhizomes now, the sort of tubers and rhizomes that exist on the forbs and of the grasses that grow on this sodic area. And there are the little piggies. Very sweet. And of course, it's a drought, and they are the ones that are going to be susceptible the most to a drought like this. They have no subcutaneous fat, which means that they are very susceptible, A, to heat and cold, so they will struggle in very hot weather or very cold weather. And it also means that when they cannot eat enough, they don't have any reserves to draw on. And that's why if you've ever eaten a warthog, and they are profoundly delicious, it's not a fatty meat at all. all right, well, they're disappearing behind there. I'm not sure if you're going to stay with us or not. What I want to do is just go a little bit forward around the corner to Sydney's Dam, where there are there is a breeding herd of elephants and a breeding herd of buffalo knocking about the place. So we'll just go around the corner here. The Pratt and Coles, I'm sure, are flying about there. The collared Pratt and Coles, thank you, Scott. Collared Pratt and Coles, not red wing. Never make that mistake again. And some zebras. Stop here, I think. There are the buffalo. Oh. question here from Randy Hacker. Now, I'm assuming that's, I don't know if that's your Twitter handle or if it's your, if, if it's your actual name. Randy Hacker, you've got a very good question. It depends how you interpret the name. Randy Hacker, a fantastic question about why do they keep changing the names of the animals? Well, it's not the mammals that they change so much. In fact, it's hardly ever. It's normally the birds. Now, Randy, that's because what happens is that throughout East Africa, for example, and into Botswana, Namibia, Zimbabwe, and then into South Africa, there are very many common bird species, to both to all regions. And the best example of, and so the, the drive to rename them has not been so much to rename them so much as to standardize the nomenclature throughout the region where that bird might be found. So the best example of it, of course, are the luries. The luries are, a group of beautiful birds. Well, we don't get very beautiful one here. We've got the most dull version. He's the gray lurie or the go, gray go-away bird. He was called the gray go-away bird everywhere else but here. And lurie is an Afrikaans word. Afrikaans is spoken only in South Africa and by a limited group of people in South Africa, far in the Western Cape, and then by a limited group of white South Africans. And so lurie is not an appropriate word to call the bird given that it extends all the way up into East Africa and indeed Central Africa. And so they're now called taracos, except for the gray go-away bird, which is called a gray go-away bird. So that's an example of why they changed the names. They, I, they won't be changing too much anymore, I don't think. I think everything is pretty standardized now. My bird book is just not very new, and so it's got the new and the old names. So that Pratt and Cole, which was the redwood Pratt and Cole, is now the collared. I mean, it's been the collared for more than 10 years, so I really should know better. And there we have a breeding herd of buffalo having a drink at Sydney's Dam, where I could swear I saw a crocodile the other day. What my crocodile call was called a hippo by another's. 
And Nicola says she can see catfish flapping about in the background. Well, that's very impressive, Nicola. She says they're flapping about every so often. <laughs> I'm sure she's right. I'm sure there are plenty of catfish in there. I think our view is about to be arrested by a small, a large white car going past us. I'm not sure why this person is driving around now. Anyway. So large herd of buffalo, probably about 150 to 200 strong. Some of them have gone, had their drink and moved off already. Others are milling about the place, shooting the breeze with the various members of the herd to whom they are attached. And the buffalo herd, they will tell, oh, there's a Pratt and Cole, you see that? It's a collared Pratt and Cole, the right-hand side, bottom right-hand side of your screen. Scott, if you're still in final control, that's called a collared Pratt and Cole there. And a herd of buffalo like this is a sort of democracy, which is quite nice. I've always liked that. They are not led by anyone specifically. The older females tend to be what we call the pathfinders, and they will generally kind of decide the direction that the herd moves. But it seems to be a very democratic process without sort of, of any fighting. They will decide democratically where to move and off they will go in a certain direction. The bulls don't have much say. That's mainly because the bulls are only in the herd for the chance to mate with some of the cows. And of course we know that the older bulls and perhaps those who are struggling a little bit to keep up with the rest of the herd will exist on their own around the pans and water holes. A little bit of fighting going on there. Very nice question here from Alison. You're in North Carolina. I'm not going to attempt the accent again. Apparently I made a hash of it. And you want to know the difference. How do you tell the difference between a boy buffalo and a girl buffalo? Well, Alison aged 11. There we go. We've double tapped in there. At this distance, the best way to tell is to look at the top of the head. So Alison, you can see that one on the left-hand side of your screen there is a female, is it? Yes. Females have got, well, in fact, look at the one in the middle of your screen there. That's a female. Her horns are coming out of the side of her head. That's very obvious there. Then if you look up and back and to the left, you can see a big buffalo there who's in the middle of having a pee. And you can see on the top of his head is a great big helmet from which his horns come. And that's how you know that's a bull. I mean, you can just look underneath their stomachs, of course, and that will tell you immediately. But at this distance, the easiest thing to do is to check the size of the horns and whether they have that helmet on top of the head, which is called a boss. On that note, let's head back to Brent Leo Smith and the Lions, see what's going on there. Hopefully they finish their afternoon toilet and are on to tea. See you just now. We can see now she's managed to get that buffalo out from wrapped inside those tree stumps. And she actually doesn't look that angry. She's more just playing with the carcass at the moment. It's quite entertaining. Look at this. Just dragging it around. <laughs> she nearly got a horn in the head from an expired buffalo. And buffalo normally horn lions when they're alive. And another lioness is coming in. amazing how a bit of movement, even though they are so full, will prompt the other to come and join. You can see, not that, not that hungry, more just almost playing with the carcass. Very contented, felt a bit cooler. And I think the arrival of another lioness might prompt a bit of feeding. Nothing like a bit of competition. Oh, there you go, 
it looks like. The one on the right is going to start feeding again. After much movement of the carcass. Pennsylvania uh, said, and I, and it was under the wrong impression uh, that lions stayed in one area. Well, they have a, a territory or home range and they move through, can be quite a vast area depending on the size of the pride. And then he's also wondering is when the lionesses have cubs, how do they find the lions to introduce them uh, to the rest of the pride? Well, they'll be able to spell them off, but they normally will just roar and call and wait for the other members of their pride to respond back. a tug of war going on here. So guys, unfortunately, we're going to have to make our way out of this line sighting for a little bit. I don't know if anyone heard when we started the car earlier and moved seems to have a problem with the gearbox so I'm just going to try and get that sorted out as quick as possible and then we'll be back hopefully before the end of the safari uh, to see what else is happening here. We'll stay for a little bit longer while they're still playing with the carcass. Hilma, who's in the Netherlands, she said she's a long-time viewer and really appreci appreciates everything we do out in the heat. <laughs> Hilma, I'll get to your question in a second while, while these lions are being playful with the carcass. Let's just watch for a little bit. seem to have calmed down. Hilma um, is wondering if there are any animals out here or any animals I can think of that sweat outside of human beings. The most obvious one is a horse. A horse is able to sweat and that's why they're able to travel such long distances because they have a good uh, air conditioning system for lack of a better description. definition of playing with your food. Joyce in Pennsylvania is wondering where exactly we are with these lions. Joyce, we're on a Juma private game reserve in the northeast um, around on a road called Quarry Pan Road. Probably about two, three hundred meters to the west of the pan itself. So hello to Maggie in Western Australia. And Maggie is saying, if I'm seeing correctly, the lions have round pupil, pupils, not... Oh, there we go. It's mine. Let's 
Maggie, I'll be back with you in a second, but just while they're growling at each other, we might see a bit of action. Oh, you'll see lions often do this. They'll try to cover as much of the carcass as possible with their bodies uh, to prevent the other lions getting a grip or even getting any piece of it. This is very typical behavior on a smaller carcass. get to you in a second. Um, I'm just going to finish Maggie's question. Maggie was wondering, that, was she seeing correctly that a lion's pupils are round rather than slitted like a domestic cat? Uh, you are spot on, Maggie, they are. And the reason for this uh, is possibly to let in more light when they're out, when they're out hunting. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, it could be to do with the fact that they are Sorry, I thought I saw something. I'm not 100% sure, but I think it could be to do with letting in light uh, for their nocturnal hunting. I will try research that for you, Maggie. So we've got... Oh, is it gone? Um, because of the, the dampness of my wet kikoi, there's an African joker butterfly that keeps trying to land on it. There's probably no other moisture in this area, so it's being enticed in by my kikoi. Disappeared now. I'll have a look where it comes back. Joker's back. There, there we go. The, the African Joker butterfly keeps fluttering around. I landed on my knee for a second. Uh, so Jared in Germany uh, would like to know, will the skull and horns be eaten? On a small... Andrew. There we go. There's my Joker. Coming to get a bit of moisture off the Kokoi. Beautiful butterfly. And you can see how it's dabbing its proboscis or its, its mouth parts onto the, the kakoi to just get that tiny bit of moisture. Now, isn't it amazing that so few, so little moisture around in the strat that this butterfly has been attracted? So it's obviously, oh, whoopsie. Mm. Flutter, flutter, flutter by. <laughs> I love butterflies. <laughs> oh. uh, sorry, Jared in, in Germany was wondering. With a lion's, oh, Andrew, it's really nice. We just want to see it was facing away from you. Now you can see those beautiful orange colours. Amazing little butterflies. I do have a soft spot for all butterflies. Oh, and finished drinking. But Jared, on a small buffer like this, the lions might be able, might be strong enough to crush open the skull and get to the brain. But on a big buffalo bull, they're not able to. Uh, the horns are eaten, but not by lions. They are eaten by a type of fish moth. And they, their larval stage will actually eat the horns. It's one of the only animals out here that's able to digest keratin, which is hair, and that's what horns are made of. But uh, with the, And with a big buffalo bull with that huge, hard skull, there are very specific types of carrion beetles um, that are almost exclusively eats sort of the brain contents of animals like buffalo after a kill. So everything will get eaten. The skull itself over time will be broken down. Uh, creatures like porcupines will gnaw it uh, for extra calcium. And yeah, they're still just 
growling at each other while lying on top of the buffalo. They haven't moved at all. And it's because they're not so hungry. If they were actually hungry, it'd probably be a bit more of a barney over what's left there. I actually have seen the lions go to sleep while sleeping on top of a carcass, trying to make sure the other lions can't get any. So while we are going to make our way back to try and get this gearbox fixed, uh, let's go across to James, who's got a very big surprise for you. There's a lioness here at Bifflesorg Dam. I'm sure it's part of the Inkohuma Pride. I'm not sure who, how many there are there. Nikki will tell me now. But I'm sure this is part of their pride that's come down to try and find something to drink here at them. So it looks like one of the lionesses from the Inkahumas has gone in search of water and has made its way towards Buffalo's Hook waterhole where it's not going to find any water. It's going to find dry, cracked clay. And look, like this, oh, she almost looked like she might start feeding. There might be a little, another little explosion shortly. like they're not up to much. You can hear red, oh, they've changed the name, sorry, green wood hoopoos cackling away in the background. And they've got a wonderful Zulu name. And you can hear that cackle, cackle. We can't see them from where we are. But in Zulu, those birds are known as the Sharabafazi, the cackling woman. And the story goes, it sounds like Zulu ladies working in a field, all shouting and joking with each other as they plant whatever crop they are planting that year. As they're going to, is it almost a stalemate now? to Rain, who's 15 years old and in Ohio. Rain would like to know, do lions have a high mortality rate in cubs like leopards? They do, also probably around 70% Rain. And again, the thing that kills the most lion cubs, like the thing that kills the most leopard cubs, uh, is a male lion, is probably the one that kills the most lion cubs. They will also be killed by hyenas, leopard, and any other predator that might find them, but generally most cubs are killed by male lions, whether they be nomadic males uh, or new males coming in to take over uh, territories and home ranges. Tony in London is wondering if we've ever been stranded next to lions with a broken gearbox or broken vehicle. 
Um, I'm trying to think. Andrew? Not, I've, def I've been stranded next to lions, but not since I've been here. We've had to help people. Yes, we've had to help people who've been stranded next to lions. Um, I've had to tow a certain arrow through the guard out a couple of times. Um, and that was stranded next to lions. And I'm, last time I was stranded next to lions was probably in Zambia. And that was because I was stuck in the mud next to lions, which does prove to be quite an entertaining thing while you're trying to dig yourself out or jack the car up to put some sticks underneath and the lions are growling at you. They were on an elephant carcass. What about when we broke down and could hear the leopard right next to us and the ah. walked down the back? Well, we, Andrew and I broke down in, in Rusty when it was giving lots of problems. Uh, when we were stuck in the bottom of a little river system, the leopard was calling five meters away from us and we had hyenas running around us and we couldn't move and we had to wait for someone to come fetch us and pull us out. There you go, the feeding has started now. A standing wire, James. There's about to be three, but you keep coming, I'm going to move out. Copy. So, we're going to leave the lines now. And, and I think James is going to try to follow that other lioness back here. But apparently he's having gremlins. I'm having car. It just seems to be one of those afternoons. So that is one of the joys of being live out in the African bush. We can't predict what's going to happen, and sometimes these technical difficulties come uh, to haunt us. So no real feeding taking place, more posturing around the kill by these two lionesses. Now, if they were more hungry, there would be definite growling, snarling, and fighting over what is left of this buffalo. The majority of this buffalo is still here. And it looks like about maybe a year and a half to two years old, judging by the horns. I can't really see them now. Oh, trying to bite a fly that was biting her. So we see those massive canines on the line. And Alice in Ohio is wondering, how long are those canines? Uh, Alice, so outside of the gum, you're probably looking at about eight to 10 centimeters, um, maybe a little bit less than that. But I've got a question for you guys out there. What mammal has longer canines than a lion? that occurs in the Sabi Sands. What mammal has longer canines than a lion? If you know the answer to that, pop me an email on questions at wildearth.tv or you can use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. What other mammal has a longer canine than a lion? I think I'm gonna catch you all out in that one. What do you think, Andrew? Hmm, 
potentially. Does, it, does Andrew know? Oh, I can guess. You can guess. Well, we'll wait until some, um, we get some more answers in before we let Andrew throw his guess out there. So, a big safari live welcome to Darlene in New Hampshire. Darlene says she's heard and would like to know if it's true that lions will not eat the stomach contents of the kill, just the stomach lining. Well, Darlene, that is 100% true. Uh, lions are carnivores and the stomach content is grass. So, with their systems, they're unable to break down cellulose. So, they will not eat the stomach content. They might inadvertently eat a few little bits but definitely not what they are after. There we go. Oh, sorry, Andrew's found the stomach contents. Uh, unfortunately, it seems that everything is going a little bit haywire today, and uh, Andrew's going to show you now what I mean. I can't really see what uh, the camera's seeing because the monitor has gone green. So it's uh, very strange looking, quite psychedelic. So Raisa and Jim, one from Finland and one from Ohio, have tuned in late on today's Sunset Safari, and they would like to know which pride this is. But well, I'm not going to tell you. You should be on time for your afternoon safaris, guys. No, I'm only teasing. <laughs> it's the Inkahuma pride. All five uh, lionesses are here. Uh, one is with James. It went in search of water at the Buffalo's Hook waterhole and found a barren dust bowl. And the other four are lying around us here. Two are feeding a little bit on their carcass and the other two are lazing in the shade. Guys, I'm going to start feeding. I'm going to start slowly trying to limp my way back towards camp, but you guys are welcome to stay with me while I do that, while James tries to sort out his technological demons. Hopefully we can get this gearbox fixed super fast and be out in two ticks. One that I'm quite worried about. Um, just to let you know what's happening with James is he's had to turn off the vehicle. The camera equipment is overheated. So hopefully in about 10 minutes he'll be out and at him again. So while we limp home slowly to try and get our gearbox sorted, I'm going to try not to change gears as much as possible. Um, it should prove to be quite an interesting drive home. trying to think maybe I could share another little African folklore with you while we were well, look who's here. He's 
Looks like he's just spotted the Lions and decided time to get out of here. A big Kulu ball. I'm trying to remember which think. Why did you guys tell me, would you like a focal on Lion or would you like all about Elephant? You choose those three. I think I've got three good ones lined up. Let me know whether you would like an African folklore on lion, leopard, or elephant. Well then, uh, to Robin, Gale, Curious One, and Rich, uh, the other mammal that's got longer canines than a lion and that lives in this part of the world is the Chakma baboon. So a big male baboon's canines are quite a bit longer than a lion's. Not quite as robust, of course, but still longer than a lion's. So there we go, guys. If you have just one more reminder while we meander off. Uh, back towards the workshop. Uh, which animal would you like an African folklore story on? Uh, a leopard, an elephant, or another lion story? Ah, actually, that is a very, very, very valid point that's come through. Some people have said. Hippo and warthog, but as far as on a hippo, those are the, the enlarged ones are in sizes, uh, and on the warthog as well, probably in sizes. But very good guess, nonetheless. Andrew, should we change? Yeah, is it worth the risk? Oh, there we go. Living dangerously out here. Andrew, what would your guess have been on that? Canines? I was going to say hippos. Ah. Oh. <laughs> just left the lions and Stephanie in Toronto is wondering what's happening with the leopards at the moment. I feel like we haven't seen any in a while. Stephanie, you're spot on. Uh, there were tracks all over the place this morning, so hopefully before the end of the sunset safari we are able to pull a leopard out of the bag. Uh, we will definitely try our best, uh, but there have been a little bit of uh, sort of not around and today's the first one we've had a lot of a lot of tracks so hopefully there are still some on property and we will be able to find them even see the other Nkakuma lioness of James as we head back towards camp. Or oh, maybe not, let's take a different route. I get so nervous at that noise. And uh, I'm sure as a lot of you out there know, gearboxes are quite scary when they start giving problems also incredibly difficult to work on. So if it is a major problem in the gearbox, we actually have to put a block and tackle above and a chain and drop the gearbox off the bottom of the engine to have a look what's wrong. But hopefully it's nothing too serious. Hopefully it's just, I'm hoping we've got a new clutch in here. I'm hoping it's just a minor adjustment on the clutch. from Miss Lynn that is uh, causing the final control ladies to try to get Andrew to do things he shouldn't. And uh, he's already, he 
was already in trouble for his little trick yesterday, in which I'm, I'm planning my revenge. He attacked me with insect repellent. Uh, but Miss Lynn, thank you very much. Miss Lynn says my hair is looking good today. And there we go. I knew he was going to do that. So funny, I'm tempted to go up again and oh maybe we should just minimize gear changes for now. Uh, my mechanics are very basic. I can do the basics, but uh, when it comes to slightly more technical things, I'm the first to bow out and, and move on to someone who knows more. One of the more dangerous things is uh, someone who knows a little bit about a lot, uh, you end up doing more damage <laughs> than if you had just admitted that you didn't know what was wrong. And you've got someone who does know to have a look at it. in Switzerland is saying she knows that we have drought from time to time but is there any regularity in it? Um, sort of two years rain, two years no rain. Uh, not quite as simple as that Heidi but there is um, not necessarily drought is abnormal so the last major drought like this was in the early 90s um, quite a long time ago but we do have wet and dry cycles so those are normally um, run at about seven eight year cycles so seven years of relatively wet seven years of drier uh, but there's m multiple cycles that are running simultaneously then you've got other sort of uh, longer cycles that are very hard to predict when they end when they begin 20 year cycles 30 year cycles the most common and easiest cycle to keep track of is the seven eight year cycle it can go as long as 10 and we have been through quite a wet cycle uh, for the last eight or nine years, and now we're going into a drought, a dry cycle. But uh, a drought to this uh, degree is uncommon. So D. Wilson is wondering how deep is Sydney's dam? Do I think it will dry up as well? It's a possibility uh, if we don't get any more rain that it will dry up, but probably if it does, it'll be towards after June, July, maybe even uh, a bit later than that. Uh, depth, I'm not sure, but probably at the deepest at the moment, it's probably a metre and a half, maybe in some spots as deep as two metres. So far, it's a tie between leopard and elephant for the folklore story. Andrew, I know, would like to have a elephant story. And uh, the elephant story, I know, ties in quite well with the draft we're having. So, for many years on the African plains, the two most powerful beings was the elephant and the rain spirit. Uh, elephant was a very proud and boastful creature and kept harassing and claiming the ra to the rain spirit that he was more important to try to get the rain spirit uh, to acknowledge the fact that the elephant was more powerful, more impressive and more important than him. The rain spirit's very valid argument was that, well, surely you need to eat and drink and I provide the rain for you to eat and drink. So, therefore, I am more powerful than you. The elephant, being very proud at that moment, refused, scoffed at the rain spirit, told him basically to go jump off a cliff. So the rain spirit said, fine, I'm out of here. 
and so with it goes the rain. So all the other animals were getting ready to give birth to their young, and uh, she's a and the rains weren't coming, and they started to get very, very worried, and uh, they gave birth. The baby started starving because the mothers could not produce enough milk, and so they went to the elephant because he was the lord of everyone because he is the biggest, and asked him, please, Mr. Elephant, please go talk to your old friend, the rain servant and get him to bring the rain back for us. So the vulture is often known as the best at doing the rain dances and Elephant went to see Vulture and said, well Vulture, you do the rain dance and bring the rain. Now Vulture, ooh, being a servant of the rain spirit, refused to help Elephant and all the other animals continued to harass him. Lovely little picture I wanted to show you, quite nice. I think it's quite nice. Um, of the elephant and the rain spirit. I think it's, can you see it nicely, Andrew? So, now as the drought continued, the o there was only one little bit of water left, and the elephant, which they often do in the in droughts, are they guard their water from anyone else, but elephant got tortoise to look after the pan for him and guard the pan. Not sure why he would have chosen tortoise, but he did. Uh, but tortoise let the other animals sneak in and have drinks every now and then. And then the elephant found out. What's that there, Andy? Sorry, yeah. Oh my goodness. Uh, nope. Sorry, false alarm. I thought I spotted a leopard. Oh, look at all the buffalo bulls. But we'll carry on. And, and the Lord Elephant went into a rage when he found out Tortoise had been sharing his water with all the other animals. And of course, faced the wrath, facing the wrath of a big bull elephant, little tortoise was uh, helpless as he got kicked around. And uh, is that a breeding herd? It looks like there's a herd that has come down here as well. Oh, very interesting. So apparently there were three there this morning. Anyway, let's, we're nearly back at the workshop. Let me finish off the thing. Uh, Tortoise then tried to sort of save himself by saying he's too small and weak. He couldn't stop the other animals. The Lord Elephant continued in a rage, as only an elephant bull can, and inadvertently ate Tortoise. And Tortoise was very fond of life and did not want to die. Uh, got into elephant's stomach and using those sharp claws and those spine, spines on the edge of the tortoise's legs, he scuffed through uh, the soft parts of elephant's stomach and managed to escape out of elephant's bottom and caused elephant great pain. And uh, he then moved off as fast as tortoises can. Uh, an elephant to this day is still a little bit nervous of tortoises, it's said, because of that scenario. Now, the great rain spirit had seen all of this and seen lots of animals dying and the huge fights over the little bit of water that remained. Uh, he decided that everyone had learnt, or elephant had learnt his tragic lesson and went to see elephant, and elephant eventually apologised and said, no, great rain spirit, you are all powerful, more powerful than me. And the heavens opened and it rained. Here we go. Hopefully I'll be able to get to a, the leopard story a little later. Preferably while sitting next to a leopard. So, 
guys, we're about to head into the workshop now and you can join us, but we are going to unfortunately have to go to Tech Loop because apparently James's camera is still down. And uh, we will come back on air and give you an update on what's happening with the vehicle. Hopefully it's a quick fix, a quick adjustment of the clutch. But if it isn't, I'm afraid we'll have to um, have to not go out again, but I'm hoping that's not the case and we'll find out shortly. So there we go. Join us as we enter the workshop and then I'm gonna have to say adieu for hopefully a very short while. Oh, monkey making an escape with some food that is stolen. Naughty monkeys. Look at them there, Andrew. There, hiding in the tree. Off he goes. Okay, so guys, I'm at the workshop. I need to just jump on there and get uh, uh, Jim Reeves here to come give me a hand and have a look what's wrong. Uh, but hopefully we'll be back in a very short time. I'll see you just now. Hello everyone, being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back in the vehicle with us. Hello everyone, being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back in the vehicle with us. Hello everyone, being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back in the vehicle with us. Hello everyone, 
Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back in the vehicle with us. Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back in the vehicle with us. Hello everybody, sorry about this, I need to just close down the, the communications, I forgot entirely. Um, I, we think Rusty is going to be okay now, haven't moved from here, went walking in there to just check and see if I could find any tracks of the leopard that Strukot was finding this morning. Shut up Game Drive channel, be quiet, right. And we'll see what happens from here on. I didn't find anything further in there. That is a very deep drainage line. There are lots of holes and things in there. I wonder if maybe that beautiful leopard of ours hasn't moved her cub cubs in there. Maybe, maybe not, we don't know. We will keep having a look out and just, you don't want to push it, you just want to see whether there are tracks going in and out of the area for the next two weeks or so, and then we'll try and find maybe and see if she's got anything in there. Uh, nothing at this stage. Brent is back at the workshop. He is, uh, Actually, this time he really is not guilty for breaking the car, which is of course amazing. We are going to try and move from this position to the lions. I'm not entirely sure where they are. I think they're on Gwari Pan Road. We'll sh should be just down there. We did see a lioness just before you came. We lost you the first time. She came down to the water here, I think to possibly try and find something to drink. Obviously she was sorely disappointed when all she got was a mouthful of fish bones and clay and so she went back to the kill. Now, we're going to try and move from here. If you do lose us, I'm very sorry about that. I suspect that will be the end of the drive. And if you are still with us, having been on Tech Loop for goodness knows how long, I'm very pleased and happy that you have chosen to be with us, and I thank you profoundly for your patience. Right, on we go. So far, I think you still have a picture of us. Oh, I haven't plugged myself in, which means I might, it might be completely black screen. David, have you heard any communications from Nicola? No. Communications from Nicola? No. Is she okay? Yep. She's fine, is she? That's a relief. Ah, oh, she's okay. How oh, wonderful. I'm just going to move this aerial out of the way, otherwise I might spike my eye on it. There we go. Now, the lioness walked around the full length of the dam, turned around, came back, across here, we went black screen, you didn't see anything. She walked down this road and then disappeared into the bushes. I'm presuming towards the hapless buffalo carcass. Ooh, David, the door's open. You mind just leaning across there and giving it a slam? We think maybe the car overheated, so we left the door open for a while and hoping that that did the job. Well done, David. That's David Eastall, everybody. World premiere today on camera for Wild Earth. Let's just cruise gently through here. Now, this is a road called Hippo Pools Road. There are no pools on it. I seriously doubt whether there are any hippos on it either. But there is a 
perfect game path that heads from this road onto the next road. And I think that's the game path on which that lioness came. So nice to see a lioness moving in the day in perfect light. A wonderful musculature in her shoulders as she padded along the side of the water, which we don't normally see, of course. Normally, they're just flat on their backs. They are tremendously, tremendously impressive when they're on the move. Now, she went off through there, I think. Gwari Pan Road is just the other side. So we'll pop around there. I'm going to drive off-road through there unnecessarily. David, this will be your first lion sighting. Well, your second, of course, your first live lion sighting. Just don't want to miss them. Shouldn't be possible to miss them, of course. It is still light, after all. Oh, they're on the road. Nicola says they're on the road, so I'm sure they're just down here. watching with Brent and you wanted clarity as to whether there are six lionesses or only five. Because as far as I'm aware, there are five. Two youngsters, well, they're not so young anymore, probably pushing three years old, and then, of course, the three others. Two were killed earlier this year, last year. In fact, three were killed last year, one in February and then two later on in the year by the Birmingham boys, and so there are only five of them left. As far as I know. In fact, definitely. If there's another one with them, I don't know where on earth she's come from. I cannot believe that this is the one road that Scott and I... In fact, this one little section of the reserve that Scott and I didn't cover this morning. It would have had high action. Anyway, so it goes in the wilderness. Five erode this. Nicholas says that they were on the road here. Well, that is very good. We are on Gwari Pan Road, Nicola. Ah, there they are. I see them. I see lions all over the place. They are all over. Let us ooze slowly along the road, and I'll count them for you, Gerda. Two eating the hapless bovid. Three lying in the shade here. No more that I can see. Hello, chaps. Pride of late has been slightly nervous of vehicles, and so I'm just going to assess things carefully. I don't think they will be nervous sitting around a buffalo kill like this, and I'm sure with all the vehicle activity that there's been here today, they'll be absolutely fine. I'm also hoping desperately to see me old pal Amber Eyes. Let's just move in there, David, I think. A bit of you. There she is. Now, 
Well, Samantha Jane, a very vi valid question during the course of this drought. Do meat eaters get sufficient moisture from their prey or do they have to drink? Um, Samantha Jane, largely leopards, for example, don't have to drink at all, but they will if there is water available. They can get enough moisture from their prey if they have to. Likewise, the same will be with lions. Lions, not quite as water independent as leopards are. Now, I think, if, we, if I'm not mistaken, that lioness looking up, listening to the call of the pearl-spotted owl, is the glorious amber eyes. Look over here, you saucy minx. Yes, I think that's her. Yeah. I think that is her. Look at them eyes. Mm. Now, Nicola says to me that she thinks there's only one sub-adult in this group and not two. So let me see if I can confirm or deny Nicola's assertion. Now, the first thing we're going to look for is the pinkness of the nose. Now, David, if you pan slightly to the left of where you are now, you'll see an extremely pink nose there. See that? Is that double tapped or can you, is that it? There, oh, look at that. Double tapped nose. Now, that to me looks like the nose of a sub-adult. So there is one. Now, here comes, and if we just come back to this lioness here, this is also look, looks like a youngster to me. She's quite short, not filled out yet. Look over here. Look over here, that's it, lift your face. There we go, very pink nose as well. And a bit smaller. So I think there are two. And Nikki says that she reckons this is the only one that is the real youngster. She might well be slightly older than the other. I don't know if they're the same age or not, at least younger than the other one. But the other one is definitely younger than the other three. So Amber Eyes, who's now in the midst of having a little greeting there, is most definitely older than both of them. Lions, it's easy to tell because their noses go black. By the time they're six years old, the noses are completely black. Leopards, not the same story. Yeah, that other one on the ground there has a very pink nose. So I think still, I'm going to still say two subish adults. I mean, they're both definitely sexually mature. They could both definitely bear youngsters at this stage. There, those two. Still got that spotting underneath. And they're very full, of course, full of buffalo meat. Makes anyone tired. Well, I hate this question, Bethany, simply because I do not know the answer to it. Bethany, you're in Virginia, and you say you reckon that lions have got shorter whiskers than leopards and domestic cats. I would have to agree with you. I've never noticed it before, but looking at Amber Eyes as she pants in total stuffedness, her belly is very, very full, I would have to agree with you that her whiskers are markedly shorter than those of a house cat or of a leopard. Why that should be the case I don't know. I'm still not convinced that anyone truly knows why cats have whiskers. That's very interesting. Very nice observation. Thank you for that, Bethany. And I'm just going to ask Nikki to turn up the microphone so that we can hear them panting. Let's see if you can hear them panting now. We 
might just be able to hear. Sarah in Ohio, aged 18, who's been watching for some time and knows these animals fairly intimately and has done a lot of research on the Inkahuma pride. In fact, it was Sarah who told me uh, embarrassedly, well, I was embarrassed, she told me what Inkahuma meant. It means brown ivory tree in the local language of Shitsonga. And Sarah, you reckon that uh, indeed it is true that two of the adults, of the young sub adults, were killed by the Birminghams and that there should be four adults here and one sub-adult. Sarah, Nikki is now your best friend in the world. I am just not convinced. So uh, what could well happen, Sarah, is that the sibling of this youngster that we're looking at now was perhaps killed indeed by the Birmingham boys, but the other one, that one with the pink nose, is definitely not as old as Amber Eyes or the scar-backed female or the female that is currently feeding at the kill. So. Yeah, I'm, all I'm going to say is that uh, it, she could well, that sibling of the one that we're watching now could well have been killed by the Birmingham boys, but that other one with the pink nose is definitely younger than the others. Thank you, Sarah. You just keep keeping us on our toes. It's very good. We love, we love this sort of thing. Nikki loves it especially. Dylan in Iowa. Lots of we were chatting about amber amber eyes as eyes, and they're amber, of course, and most lions have sort of greeny yellow eyes. And you want to know if, if it's possible for lions to have blue eyes. I think what you will find if there was an albino lion, it would have blue eyes. I don't think the leucistic white lions, again, one of our viewers may well know, the leucistic white lions have blue eyes. I think they've got the same color eyes as normal lions. Blue eyes, I have never seen in an adult lion. I've seen it in an adult leopard. I have not seen it in an adult lion. And when they're born, I'm pretty sure there's a bluish tinge to their eyes. But I think that changes pretty quickly. I might be wrong there. I'm no expert on their eye color. But please do check me up and let me know if I'm wrong. Hashtag Safari Live questions wildearth.tv. As you all know, well, some of you do. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from when you do get hold of us. It's lovely to know where in the world you happen to be watching from. Look how her nasal cavities have opened up all the way to get as much oxygen in to her lungs and then around the stomach to help her digest her food. Now, this is actually quite a nice opportunity to just compare that structure with the structure of a hip, uh, not, I nearly said a hippopotamus, of a cheetah. It's nothing like a hippopotamus. A cheetah has enormous nasal, nasal cavity, even bigger than that comparatively. And that's because the top canines, which you can just see peeping out in the bottom, that's the bottom tooth there is a top canine. In a cheetah, those canines are vastly reduced to make space for extra oxygen to go through the nasal cavity and into the lungs because, of course, to maintain that unbelievable speed of 60 miles an hour or more than 100 kilometers an hour, the cheetah has got to suck in massive, massive amounts of oxygen to create the energy required for the incredible running speed that they're able to generate. So that's why they struggle sometimes to bring down their prey and, prey and kill them because they have those short teeth which are not quite as powerful or potent as those of the lion or the leopard. Thank you, Cat and Tampa. You say David is doing a great job on camera. 
Well done, David. <laughs> Thank you, Kat. You know, time will tell. Time will tell. I think he's doing a pretty good job, too. Also a nice opportunity to look at the toes there, and you can see the different kinds of uh, tracks that they would leave. So Samantha Jane is in Johannesburg, my hometown, and David's hometown, if I'm not mistaken, from Johannesburg. Um, David, Samantha Jane would like to know, is this your first time filming wildlife? It is my first time, James. It is his first time filming Wildlife, Samantha Jane. And what did you do before? Uh, background in live. Background in live filming, documentaries, a couple uh, of commercials. Magazine style, news style. Magazine style news programs. There we go. So, this is probably just about as exciting for you as it is for everyone. He's, uh, he's smiling from ear to ear. Of course, being a cameraman out here, and I mean, I don't speak from the point of view of experience because I'm a horrendous cameraman, um, is very different from shooting, say, a BBC wildlife documentary. So if you look at something like The Hunt or Planet Earth or some of the National Geographic stuff, of course, you go in with a large crew of people and you set up a shot and you see if you can get the shot and then if you can't, you go home and have a cup of coffee and maybe a drink and then you come back the next day and or sometimes you sit for hours and hours and hours waiting for one shot. Out here, of course, you've only got one chance and that chance may fleet away before you get the chance. The number of things that we see out here, we go, oh, let's quickly look there and we can't quickly get, get to it enough is amazing. And so the camera job of a live wildlife cameraman is something pretty pioneering that we're doing over here and so the guys that we have here I think are tremendously skilled I think the presenters and um, the face of, of what we of what we do we like to think of ourselves as tremendously talented and completely irreplaceable to the world um, the truth is probably that we are probably imminently replaceable but these live cameramen are much more difficult to replace. It's a real skill to do what Brian and Viam and David and Andrew are doing at the moment. And Andre again, come the 29th of February. Let me just get out of the way here. Let us look at this lioness eating her buffalo. You can see the teeth there of the buffalo. Smiling. It's not really smiling. <laughs> and it's a joke, everyone. The buffalo is not smiling. It is not alive anymore. Young buffalo. And that's interesting. I wonder, actually, because I didn't see any tracks of a herd of buffalo coming through here. And the other day, there were a number of buffalo herds that I'm sure was splintered from a bigger group and they seem to have been chased out of Arethusa by this very pride of lions and I wonder if one of those splinter groups wasn't caught sort of in amongst the thick trees here of this drainage system and I wonder if that's not what happened that the Inkahuma pride came across a small splinter group of buffalo in amongst the trees here. And as Scott says, said this morning, when there were only three females at the pan today, which is extremely odd to have three females in a herd of buffalo, that maybe they've split off because of a scuffle they've had. I have another theory as well, though, and I'm not sure which one is correct. Uh, maybe they have both something to do with it. But the interesting thing is that normally you'll read in the textbooks, of course, and animals, unfortunately, never follow textbooks, but you will read that Buffalo herds and elephant herds are far larger during the dry season. This is a dry season of sorts because the water is concentrated and so they move in a 
big group to, from water point to water point, and that's generally how it moves. And then once the water becomes more dissipated during the wet season, there's water in the pans, there's water in the temporary water holes, sometimes even in the rivers, and so the herds split up and to take advantage of all the different water sources. Now, what I suspect's happening now is that because instead of the water being concentrated, or because the water's concentrated, it's left huge swathes of land around the water holes that have nothing to eat in them. And so I think what you'll find is that the herds are also splitting off into smaller related groups to go and forage amongst more distant areas where they wouldn't normally go, or amongst areas like this, which, I mean, this is definitely sub-optimal buffalo habitat, very little grazing going on through here. Maybe splinter groups are going or foraging in areas where they wouldn't normally go. And maybe that's why we're having these small groups of buffalo moving around the bush. Again, that might be utter nonsense, but I think that sounds quite likely, given the parlor state of the grazing at the moment. Quite a morbid but attractive group of colors there. That golden green with the red behind it, until you realize what it is. Hello, Virginia, on Tweet Tweet. You want to know how long the lions have been at this particular kill? Virginia, I think they killed this buffalo last night. Their tracks came across the cheetah cut line just to the north of where Scott turned off the cheetah cut line this morning. And I'm pretty sure that those tracks came from last night, and they probably wandered through this woodland either early this morning or late last night. And I think that's how long they've been here. Now, think about going to get some water this, uh, this evening, I would think. Bifflesook Dam is obviously not an option, but Torchwood Dam is not too far from here. That's where they sort of come from. They were, of course, two days ago, they were eating a dead hippo on a coral. They obviously didn't find the hippo meat to their taste, and they wanted some more veal. So they're now having some, some veal mignon underneath a cumbritum, a piculatum tree. Good place to eat, really. The others are fast asleep. As lions tend to be, most of the time. Okay, that's very interesting. Thank you very much, Maggie. You were out in South Africa recently. You saw some leukistic lions, and you say that the sub-adults of just about main growing age have got pale blue eyes. That's wonderful. I would love to see a lion with pale blue eyes. I think the blue would go rather splendidly with their tawny fur. I'm just going to quickly check the radio. I hear the approach of a vehicle. Interesting. I hear whistling. Station approaching Nkuhuma Pride on Gwari Pan Road while whistling. Hey, affirmative, you can join. That was just uh, to basically say to you then, why are you whistling while coming to a lion sighting? Various strange thing to be doing. Look at those amber eyes, not blue, but amber. Oh, 
Dylan, you're in Iowa. You've also been doing some research on pike or pale lions. And you say that the lions of the Timbavati, of course, are not albino, but leukistic, absolutely. And you say that their eyes are pretty blue. That's wonderful to know. Thank you very much for clearing that up for me. I've never actually thought about it before, to be honest. Uh, but I guess it would make sense. So that's Taxon coming into the sighting. One of his guests was filled with the joys of the wilderness and was therefore whistling as they came towards the sighting, probably completely unaware that anyone else was here. Oh. I think let's just wait for them to settle down. Maggie, you're in Australia and you asked Brent the question as to why the, and Sharon in Pittsburgh, why the big cats like this have got round pupils in their eyes and the little ones like the house cats have got those sort of uh, slitty eyed. How would you describe them? I suppose, um, I'm not sure what that uh, oval, vertical, oh, there we go. Nicola's decided it's a vertical slit here. Yeah, there's a much better way of putting it. Thank you, Nicola. And I've been asked this before, and I seem to remember somebody sending through an answer, and to my eternal discredit, I cannot remember what it was, save to say that I think that you'll find that the smaller cats, which are descended from the African wildcat, are far more likely to be even more nocturnal than are the large cats like this. And so I think what you'll find is that it's to allow even more light into the eye during the course of the night. That would be my only guess. Because they are definitely, you know, these lines are obviously awake during the day. For you to find a serval or an African wild cat or a black-footed cat around here active during this time of the day would be almost impossible. We have a question from Sam Chevalier. And I think Sam Chevalier, if I'm not mistaken, you're in Cape Town. Um, of course, uh, related to some fairly eminent film people. And Sam, you want to know if the Majingalan, Majingalan coalition of male lions comes this far north into the Sabi Sands and into Arethusa. Sam, and just for those of you who don't know, the Majinga Lion Coalition are a dominant coalition of lions that basically occupy the western sector of the Sari Sands, a very vast territory. And Sam, they don't come as far as Juma. They do touch the western edges of Arethusa every so often, but not very often at all. And as they get older, of course, they're being pushed a little bit more further to the west. The Birmingham boys have taken up residence in the eastern and northern sectors. The Matimba males, who used to be the dominant coalition here, disappeared immediately on sighting the Birmingham boys. They put up as much fight as a bushveld gerbil would have, went down into Londolozi and created a postage stamp-sized territory for themselves there. And they are wedged now between the Birmingham boys and the Majingilan coalition. And I think that coalition consists of four still. So they don't come this far east. They do touch the western fringes of Arethusa every so often, but not often. So Sam, that is the case of the Majingalan males. I'm not sure how you know them, but of course you do come from an eminent filming family, so perhaps you were, you know, au fait with information that many of us don't have. I don't think these lions are going to do a huge amount other than lie here at the moment and maybe do a bit more feeding a bit later, later on. So let's sit here for a few more minutes and then we'll probably press on and see what else we can find. Oh, 
punch. Um, Darlene in New Hampshire, you're wondering about male lions, and if they were around this area, would that kind of aloe grooming, the greeting, the fond head rubbing that takes place, would it take place? Uh, if there was a male lion here, Darlene, yes, it would, absolutely, once he'd eaten his fill. There's no affection unless he has eaten his fill. If he hasn't eaten his fill, he will just start beating people up, basically, beating up the lionesses until he has eaten sufficient, and then he will lie down, and they will greet each other during the course of finishing the kill. I'm just going to reposition the car slightly, half because I want to see where the, what's happening at the kill, and half because I have an audience of people next to me, and they're making me feel a little bit awkward. It's not your fault. It's my fault. See if we can get a better look at the kill. Now we've got to drive pretty close to the ones on the right hand side here. So we're just going to ease gently past. If they stand up, we'll just keep going. What we don't want to cause is alarm. The lioness there is looking straight at the virtual reality rig. That would be an expensive pounce. Where would you see that? In fact, are you comfortable there? I'm just going to stop here actually for a little while. They look very relaxed. I'm going to drop my voice. Just move slowly when you move around. It's OK. This is David Day. It's first time for lines, of course, at... We are now probably two and a half metres from them. That's pretty close. And you can see the lioness is definitely looking at the camera. She's looking at the aerial. And of course, I think there's an element of entertainment about that. Now, Sarah and Nicola, I want you to look at these two lines because, well, this is assuming David can maintain focus, of course. That line is there, has got the pink nose. That, of course, is the very young one. Well, very young by, I'm saying she's probably about three years old. Now, if we go straight across to the one at the far end there, there, yeah, that's the one. No, no, left there, no behind, looking at us with a pink nose. That's it. You see, I think that lioness is the same age. Let's just, yeah, let's have a good look at that one, and then let's have a look at the middle one as well, because she's got a pinkish nose too. So you see, to me, that nose looks exactly the same age as the other one. Then if we look at the middle-nosed one here, this is astonishing. Nicola's ability to recognize animals is quite amazing. You can see that that nose is starting to turn black. Now, she's identified it, Nicola has, by those two spots there, which will eventually become an entirely black nose. So that's how the noses start to go black. So she's definitely older than the other two. I'm sorry to you too, Sarah and Nicola. I'm afraid I think these other, these other two lionesses, I think, are the same age. I think they're both pushing three years old. I might be wrong. <laughs> I might be wrong, though. I'm definitely not going to put money on it. She's beautiful, isn't she? Yes. Yes, you know I'm talking about you. Mm -hmm. Perfectly straight teeth. Looks like an orthodontist's dream. Sharp canines. Could do with a bit of a clean, I suppose. That's wonderful. Look at that. Hey, look at that. Great shot. You do not want those things clamped about your arm. So there are two things I'd like you to notice about this. Of course, this is 
The first is the fact that these eyes are not amber. They're that yellow, yellow green color. And Rebecca, you're in Santa Barbara, and you want to know who leads the hunt. Is there a dominant lioness here? Do they change? Look at that. Isn't that amazing? Look at the flecks. I'll get back to your question there. I'll get back to your question, Rebecca, but look at those flecks of brown in the eyes, and you can see now how much they're panting. That's so cool. You can even see the muscles of the iris there, or the lens on the iris. That's fantastic. In fact, you might be able to see the reflection of the vehicle in her eyes. I think you can. I think you can. This is so cool. There, look, you can. That's magnificent. Very cool. So, Rebecca, you want to know if there's a lead lioness during a kill? Um, there is no lead lioness in a, a lion pride. The oldest and biggest will dominate a kill, obviously, until she starts to lose weight as she gets older, and then she will have to make her way back down the pecking order. But during a hunt, I don't think there is, in fact, I'm 90% sure that there isn't a lead lioness at all. The pride sort of acts on instinct as a team. They move around. It's completely unlike a wild dog or wolf pack where the alpha will take the lead and the others will follow. I don't know if any of you have seen that very funny um, video that's been popping around social media of late, and it's a picture of hang on, high action here, some greeting going on. Oh, swapping at the kill. Anyway, during this wonderful video, there is a herd of wildebeest running past a female, and she's hiding behind a bush and they can see her, and they just keep dodging her, but she could easily leap on one of them, and she just doesn't seem to be able to make a decision. Until a male lion eventually comes just bounding from nowhere, grabs her. This is fantastic. Oh, forget my talk. Well done, Dave. Brilliant. So, not an altruistic society. Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back on the vehicle with us. Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back on the vehicle with us.
Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back on the vehicle with us. Sorry about that high action. I think it was maybe David's very swift movement that the camera couldn't handle, and we swung around to see those two lionesses fighting over the kill. Even though they are all so full and so fat, they are still fighting over the bits of meat that there are. That's what lions do. There's nothing altruistic about their society. There's nothing friendly about their society to each other. You see them greeting each other. You see them helping out when they hunt. But when it comes down to it, they are totally vicious with each other. So we're just moving back into the site now. I think we're going to have it to ourselves. I'm just going to wait here. There's a female coming in now. Well, obviously it's a female, there are no males here. We're just going to wait and see what's going on. Three of them still away from the kill, two of them still at the kill. She's cleaning her paws. And Nicola would now like to give me my, her opinion on this female. This will be good. Care for it, Nicola. Come on, then. Tell us who this is. So Nicola reckons that this one is very obvious because her bottom right canine is broken. And she's one of the oldest lionesses. Well, we can definitely see that from the fact that her nose is completely black. And her face is quite pale normally. It won't be pale at the moment because it'll be covered in gore and blood, which is why she's giving herself a bit of a wash. She's definitely missing her bottom right canine at this stage, though. Thank you, Nicola. Right, I'm going to move into where Aubrey, where Tax was parked there, because the lions are still giving the odd grunt and growl at each other. If we can get a close-up of them having at each other, it will be marvellously exciting. with each other, these lionesses. Still growling. Just going to ease our way in here. How's that, David? Right. Now we're going to speak a little bit more quietly because obviously we're very close to the lions, but they don't normally react to our voices at all. This pride has of late been a little bit ornery around the cars, but I think that was because of the mating that they were doing with the Birmingham boys, and they seem to be a little uneasy with life. But at the moment, they seem very happy and fine.
hello, Bill Burkett. You want to know where on earth the male lions are? Uh, Bill, the last we heard, they were on a coral munching a hippopotamus that had recently met its end. And I think what you'll find, Bill, is that they've moved from their back south towards Mala Mala. As far as I understand, that's what's happened. I couldn't be sure, to be honest. I'm not, I haven't had a, an update about them, but I think that's where they are. Just remember, everyone, that the males, of course, are not part of the pride. They are an independent coalition that will dominate a number of pride territories. And so we often think, of course, of prides containing females and a dominant male who looks after them, Allah the Lion King, the greatest biological suite of lies ever told. Lovely story, though, of course. But the males are never part of the pride. They would come in here and steal this kill if they knew it was here, I have no doubt. But the females will not necessarily want to be around the males at all unless the males are thinking about mating. Or well, unless the females are ready to mate, unless they're in estrus and ready to mate. Wendon, Wendy in Hampton Bay, you want to know about the respiration rate of a female lion. Wendy, I'm afraid I couldn't possibly tell you what the respiration rate is. Um, I've actually forgotten exactly what the units of respiration are. I think it's probably kilojoules per minute or so, something like that, or calories per, per minute. I don't know what the respiration rate is, I'm afraid, Wendy, but I would, be, I would like to know. I'd be fascinated to know what the resting respiration rate of a female lion is. Respiration, remember everybody, is not an interchangeable word with breathing. A lot of people will use the words interchangeably. Breathing rate would be the number of breaths, of course, per minute or per whatever unit time you choose to use. Respiration is the conversion or the uh, co combination of using oxygen and food to create energy. As far as I remember my high school biology, that is. And of course, we've seen these lionesses mating of late with a new coalition called the Birmingham Boys. And Anna, you're obviously considering the fact that there could be inbreeding around, and are there enough lion prides to prevent inbreeding? Anna, inbreeding happens just about all the time with lions, but remember that it can last up to six generations before there is a defect. Um, so that is, it's very common in cats, it's very common in leopard, it's very common in lions. In this particular case, though, I think those Birmingham boys, I actually know the farm from which they come. It's just next to where I used to work, in the Timbavati, on the Timbavati River, beautiful piece of land up about 70 kilometers north of where we're sitting now. And so I'm 99% sure that those five Birmingham males are not related to these lionesses and therefore there will be an injection of very valuable new genes to the area. Nice question, thank you for that, Anna. Now, let's just have a listen and see if we can hear any interesting calls. We're at that time of the day that I call the changing of the guard when the daytime animals go to the night. Let's just have a listen. sandpaper tongue 
as she draws it over the buffalo calf. There was in the distance a pearl-spotted owlet calling. And then there's some Franklins calling off towards Biffles Hook Dam. But otherwise, very, everything is very silent. Koki Franklin's calling. Koki, But again, a very subdued evening chorus in the same way that the morning chorus is very subdued in the absence of moisture. For some reason, with the, with the drought, the dawn chorus has been extremely subdued. Wolfie, you're in London, and you want to know if we came wandering through the bush here and we came across these lions, A, would they show interest towards us, and B, would they, what would we then do? Would we turn around, scream loudly and run away, or would we stand our ground and back away slowly? Wolfie, the latter is definitely the correct method of um, dealing with lions on foot. Normally, lions like this, I've seen this pride on foot, and they move away quite quickly, otherwise they just sit up and look. And then they, if you just back away, they will normally lie back down again and not think twice about you again. Lions, remember, are threatened by us, and so it is relatively safe to find them on foot. Look at the beautiful shot of amber eyes eating. Stunning picture of her eyes there. So, Wolfie, absolutely, you don't ever run from a cat. It's exactly the same as a house cat. They will give chase if you run and especially if they charge. So remember, sometimes lions will charge you. You have to stand still. If you turn around and run away, you can get yourself into big trouble, mostly because a human being is one of the slowest creatures out here. And secondly, because a cat, like all cats, lions are the same. They will chase something that appears to be prey. So if you stand still, of course, you're not behaving like prey. Wonderful question, and again, um, possibly a result of the Lion King, that biological fallacy created by Disney so many years ago. In fact, I think it was its 22nd anniversary this year, if I'm not mistaken. Wonderful film. You want to know if lions will scavenge, or do they only kill for themselves? Keith, lions are the most effective scavengers that there are out here. They are pilfering pirates Thieves, far more so probably than even hyenas are, where hyenas will often just sort of pick up scraps that are left lying about the place. They will definitely steal from animals if they can. Lions are brilliant scavengers, and male lions especially. Now, if you think about it, of course, we talk about female lions doing the killing and then the males enjoying it. All those males are doing is simply scavenging off the work of the females. So the male lion is the ultimate scavenger out here. They will kill if they have to, but if they can avoid killing, if they can steal a meal, the male lions will definitely do that and spend the rest of their time marking territory and looking about the place. Well, other than sleeping, of course. But yes, very effective scavengers. Most of the predators out here, lions, hyenas, leopards, um, not wild dogs, of course, and not cheetah, so the, the sort of um, the group predators are all pretty effective scavengers. Sorry, I'm talking nonsense. They're not the group predators. The bigger ones are effective scavengers. Leopards won't scavenge. Um, they won't take a risk to scavenge, but they will definitely steal food if they can. It's a great big fallacy that only hyenas are scavengers. And in some places, you know, parts of East Africa, Lions scavenge more than hyenas. 
and hyenas do more hunting than lions. Hyenas are very, very effective hunters. Look at those claws. Oof, look at those claws. So the picture is getting a little bit darker, which of course makes it very difficult. The cameraman, and it's much darker in reality than it is on your screen. I know I say that quite a lot, but I think it's quite important to understand. Now, uh, because these are adult lions and they're on a kill, I don't mind putting a little bit of light on them. So I'm just going to wash the tree above them in a bit of sort of diffused light. And that should improve the picture slightly. We've just got a few more minutes here, so I think we won't move from here. We'll just sit here until the end. How's that, David? That's better. Oh, sorry, sorry, my girl, let me take that out of your eyes a bit. It's not quite the candlelit romance that she was enjoying. There we go. So I think they'll probably feed on this for the rest of the night. I suspect by the morning they may be gone. They may still be lying about here. But the hyenas will struggle to scavenge this this stage, of course, because it doesn't smell much. It hasn't been out in the sun for long enough to start rotting. There hasn't been much of a wind today. There certainly hasn't been a wind blowing from the southeast. If there had been, it would have been blowing towards our friends at the hyena den, and they may be sort of on their way here to see what was going on. But this is a goodly sized pride of five lionesses, and it'd have to be a big group of hyenas to try and steal it from them. Kathy in New York, a controversial subject for some, not so much for others. You want to know if lions get names like leopards do. Um, Kathy, not so much. Their, their prides do. So we call this the Unguhuma pride, obviously. And that one, of course, which we're looking at is very obviously amber-eyed, so we call her amber eyes. I suppose we might call the one with missing tooth uh, missing tooth or toothless wonder, something like that. We don't, though. We do tend to name the lions far more than we do, at least the leopards far more than we do the lions. Um, rightly tell you why that was. I mean, initially, certainly where I used to work down south, we didn't used to name the leopards but for their after their territories or from their spot patterns. I mean, there's no actual difference whether you name a leopard Bob or the three, four female. It doesn't really make a huge difference. It's still an identifying marker. But with the lions, because they live in a group, we tend to sort of lump them together and less is an obvious feature. So, Kathy, that's why we do that. And we've named the hyenas, of course, um, at the den simply because, well, I've named them simply because it's easier to then talk about them. It became totally unwieldy when we had three or four different generations saying the, the cub, the male cub that was born in June has just come out of the den. So that's why we've named the hyena cubs. But as they turn to adults, I suspect that nomenclature will become less and less important. The only reason it's slightly controversial and why people, some people don't like it, some of the purists don't like it, I don't mind it in the slightest, but is because it's kind of anthropomorphizing. It takes away some of the wildness, perhaps, of the animals. I don't really believe it does that. And if it creates a, a character for people to follow and enjoy, well, then why not? certainly our wonderfully um, loyal viewers have really enjoyed following the characters and the name does give give an animal a character Interesting, BJ, two aspects to your question. I think two aspects that are very interesting to your question, BJ. The first one is, well, you want to know, are there any vultures around? The answer is no, there are no vultures around. Now, the obvious question, therefore, is why are there no vultures around? Was it a cold day? No, it wasn't. Were there vultures flying? There must have been. So why aren't there any around here? Two reasons. I think the first is that this kill is very cleverly hidden underneath a fairly leafy tree, which is no mean feat given the sparsity or 
scarcity of leaves around at the moment, so I think it would have been difficult for a vulture to see. Remember, vultures um, scavenge by sight. They don't scavenge by their noses, so they would have struggled to see this. And the second reason, I think, is that I don't believe that there are nearly as many vultures here as there used to be. I think there are far fewer. I don't know why. I think it's got something to do with their being trapped for traditional medicine. I think it's also got a lot to do with the vulture restaurants that they have. There's that thick tree under which the buffalo calf is hidden. They've got vulture restaurants at various tourist hotspots along the mountains. And I think, you know, if a vulture can get out of a tree, fly off and have eat a sort of emaciated piece of cattle rather than fight a lion for some buffalo, I think that's what it's going to do. I think those are the two reasons we're not seeing a lot of vultures at the moment. I've definitely noticed since my first foray into the Timbavati almost 16 years ago, there is a distinct lack of a different species of vulture. I only ever see white-backed and perhaps the odd hooded one white-headed vulture, one lappet faced vulture here. It didn't used to be like that. So I think that's quite an indictment. It's quite sad. I wish I knew the answer to your query. Why is it that the Birmingham boys don't visit Juma as much as they used to? Um, Derek, I think that there's a very good reason for that, and I think that reason is the fact that there's no threat. There's no male lion threat to the north of where they are. There's a big threat to the south in Mala Mala. There are lots of male coalitions in the south around Lion Sands area. There's a, there's a Majinga Lion coalition to the west, of course. There is the Matimba still sandwiched between the two. And there's probably quite a lot of pressure from the east inside the Kruger to the east of Mala Mala. But up here, there isn't so much. There are the two Salati males to the north in Biffles Hook. They have made no forays furthest than sort of halfway south of Biffles Hook. Now, I don't know if you're looking at a map, perhaps. I could try and draw it for you, but I'd have to get out of the car, which would result in, uh, well, some unpleasantness. So I think the only reason that we're not seeing the Birmingham boys on Juma here at the moment is because it's sitting between two territories and no lions are coming onto the, the area and roaring, which means no one's kind of claiming it. And so therefore there's no need for, any, for them to try and defend it. I hope that sort of answers your question. Good one, thank you. Wonderful sounds of crunching there. Now, Zella, just quickly before we leave, you want to know you're 10 years old, which is a wonderful age to get enthusiastic about the wilderness. You want to know what a lion's favorite food. Depends on the lion, Zella. Just like your friends, some of them will enjoy chocolate, some of them will enjoy mm, popcorn or candy floss, perhaps. Uh, so it is with lions. This pride definitely likes buffalo. They like eating buffalo a great deal, and I think they eat a huge amount of buffalo. Some prides like giraffe, some prides like impala. But that's, this one seems to be buffalo. All right, everyone, that's it from us. Um, we're going to leave you short, um, in about 20 seconds, I think. A big thank you to David. Well done, David. Good job today. No thanks, of course, to Brent. And um, Brent was being filled by Andrew, who went home early today. Thanks a lot for your help, guys. And a big thanks to Nikki and Leanne on debut. Big thanks to all of you for your questions and comments throughout the day. It's been a wonderful learning experience. We'll see you tomorrow in the early morning at 0530. Bye-bye.